we have my co-chair person again a very important person the who country president of sri lanka dr rasia pense uh, who is uh, head in the who's response in the country related to covid-19 prevention and uh, we have several distinguished luminaries and experts in public health in the audience as well so i'll hand over my i hand, hand over to dr rasia pense my co-chair person for opening remarks Thank you, Professor Karnantilake, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure you all would be listening in and um, processing the information that has been flowing through since morning. And uh, I was there for some time, and all the presentations that have been made have really put, uh, you know, kind of different perspectives on managing the COVID-19 pandemic that has impacted everyone across the globe, affecting lives and livelihoods. Uh, while it is true that it has, called major, uh, it has caused major disruptions, it has also uh, brought out uh, the, the force of human enterprise and ingenuity, including innovations. Um, we got to know about the disease, the viral, viral genome was mapped uh, in January and by February, we already had a discussion on R&D blueprint on how to tackle this novel coronavirus, which later on was named as SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic response, uh, the World Health Organization has been convening experts around the globe to look at uh, uh, the diagnostics, the therapeutics, and also the vaccine for protection against the disease. Um, this has been a historic uh, response to the pandemic, <clears throat> where in a very short time, we were able to get the PCR diagnostics. There's a lot of research on getting the therapeutics while a <clears throat> effective and safe antiviral against SARS-CoV-2 still evades us. There has been a lot of research on repurposing ex existing antivirals and the specific anti-coronavirus antiviral, which is remdesivir. Unfortunately, uh, WHO latest recommendation is against the use of remdesivir, especially for, serious, uh, for severe illness. Uh, at the same time, we have also seen advances in therapeutics in terms of use of corticosteroids, for uh, protecting those with severe illness, for reducing mortality, and research is ongoing. There are multiple trials, the series of solidarity trials, which all look at therapeutics, diagnostics, and of late, there's also the solidarity vaccine trial. We will be listening in during this, uh, the course of this session to very important and eminent speakers who are a force to reckon with in their own fields. And we, we would be touching upon vaccine, the immunological uh, basis of COVID-19, and what are some of the paradigm shifts in terms of the development of therapeutics for COVID-19. So without taking eating into the session and moving on to the technical presentations, May I now present Professor Nilika Malavige. Professor Nilika Malavige, currently professor in immunology and molecular medicine, also the director of the Center for Dengue Research, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. She is an academic visitor at MRC Human Immunology Unit, University of Oxford, and a member of the executive committee of the International Society of infectious diseases. She has been working on the immunopathology and correlatives of protection on dengue, and now also works on the immune responses to SARS-CoV-2. Professor Malavige would be sharing with us the latest on COVID-19 vaccines. Professor Malavige, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, I, I'm going uh, to yeah, talk about her uh, immunity, uh, uh, whether with the vaccines we are going, going to actually reduce the immunity, immunity or are we only going to target the, uh, the vulnerable uh, population uh, and the types of vaccines and how they work and, and what are the safety issues we are looking for. 
Uh, so, so I know everybody, everybody must be familiar, familiar with her immunity because this is a public health conference. And uh, just to take you through this, I'll get my point out. Okay, so if, if there are no immune individuals in a population, when, a, when certain individuals are infected, uh, the whole population or a large number of the population are infected. But, but for instance, instance if a uh, large number of the population are immune, immune even if certain individuals are infected, the infection is not transmitted because of these immune individuals. So uh, this herd immunity can be induced either through uh, natural means of everybody getting the infection or through vaccination nowadays, which is very successful in many vaccines like measles, rubella, mumps, uh, and, and so on. So, so now, now when we talk, talk about immunization against COVID, against COVID uh, are we uh, going to aim at inducing herd immunity or are we going to be uh, inducing uh, just vaccinating the vulnerable populations to make sure uh, reduce the mortality and morbidity? Uh, now, how much herd immunity do we need? That depends on the R0 value. Again, this is a public health conference. I won't want to talk about R0, but basically it's the number of people that an infected person infects. Uh, now, now highly infectious diseases, diseases like measles, uh, so, so many people are infected by, by particular individuals, so the R0 value is like 12 to 18 percent. And to prevent infection or to induce herd immunity, you have to have 92 to 94 percent of individuals being immune in the population. And for and some, some infections like H1N1, like uh, because, because the R0 value, value is less, uh, the, the herd immunity is 40%, percent, which means 40% 40 of the population, population need to be immune to stop the spread of infection. infection. Now, when, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, the median R0 value is given at 5.7. I think it differs according to various countries and various studies. But basically, for SARS-CoV-2, 82.5% of the population need to be immune to stop transmission. And so the big question is, can we achieve it? And if so, when uh, to get rid of COVID? Now, now, there's a lot of uh, worry uh, about, uh, not from the anti vaxxers but, but from a lot of scientists, doctors, whether how safe these vaccines are and whether we take a shortcut in, uh, unnecessary shortcuts in introducing these vaccines. Because as everybody knows, it takes a very long time uh, to uh, to develop vaccines. You have the preclinical stage, uh, the animal study stage, and then when those are successful, you start with phase one, which is one to two years, then go on to phase two, phase three again, which is two to three years, and then only going to production, which takes about 15 years along. So in this, as far as COVID-19 vaccines are concerned, we know that we now are uh, UK vaccinated people and SARS-CoV and the vaccine development has been around 10 months. Now, how did this happen? Of course, some vaccines already had vaccine constructs. So, for example, the Oxford vaccine, uh, which is a uh, which is had one, it yeah, uses a chimpanzee adenovirus, virus, and that had already been there uh, uh, for, for the SARS virus, the SARS-CoV-1, and they had already done three clinical uh, studies and animal studies. Uh, so, the so vaccine construct was there here, and uh, they only substituted uh, the SARS-CoV-1 with the size spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. So, because of that, so, so many other vaccine manufacturers also had certain uh, things ready that they could uh, immediately uh, go into phase 1 clinical trials. So, in this instance, the phase 1, phase 2, and phase 3 clinical trials overlap with each other. And while the phase 3 trials initiated, uh, the production also started. It's a big risk, but we don't know whether uh, the, the vaccines would be working. But still, a lot of people took that risk, the manufacturers, and started making these vaccines. Now, there are three, uh, 10 vaccines currently undergoing phase three trials. Uh, of, uh, so, the, uh, starting from Pfizer, Moderna, uh, the Oxford, the Amelia, which is the Russian vaccine, uh, and several Chinese vaccines. Now, what is different is, now, uh, there are several new vaccine platforms that have been introduced for COVID-19, which some individuals might not be uh, familiar with. Everybody knows about these inactivated vaccines, which are, which the virus are formerly inactivated, and this is the basis uh, for uh, vaccine construct for a lot of uh, three Chinese vaccines. So, there are three Chinese vaccines under development uh, and under the uh, clinical trials, which use the inactivated vaccine platform. And, and then, then the Oxford vaccine, vaccine and the Russian, Russian vaccine, vaccine use, use, use this replication in the vector, 
Yeah, yeah, so, so, so it's, it's an adenovirus vector. In the case of Oxford, it's a chimpanzee adenovirus. In the case of the Russian vaccine, it's a human adenovirus. So where you insert the spike protein. And the other platform is this mRNA vaccine, which I just briefly talked about. Uh, so, and so based on the type of vaccine, the storage temperature changes. For the Pfizer and Moderna, it is sub, uh, very poor temperatures, minus 7 to minus 20. For, for the Oxford vaccine, vaccine uh, it is the regular temperature, temperature uh, and, and, and so is uh, for the Russian vaccine, vaccine and the Chinese vaccine. vaccine. And, and just, just what, what do we, we call, call about this replication uh, incompetent adenovirus vaccine? vaccine. So, uh, uh, so this uh, the Oxford vaccine, uh, which is marketed by AstraZeneca, uh, uses a chimpanzee adenovirus and, and, uh, and uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein introduced into the genome. So when the, when the virus infects a human, it, uh, the virus is the proteins are transcribed, and on, and, and this has, uh, the spike protein is pressed, so you get antibodies and T cell responses to the spike protein. The important thing is it's a non-replicating virus, so the virus will not continue to replicate in the host. And as far as Oxford vaccine is concerned, it's a chimpanzee adenovirus. So humans have not been infected with that virus before, so we do not have antibodies against the that virus, and we will not, therefore, inactivate the uh, vaccine virus. Whereas there's a concern that when you use human adenoviruses, because we have been infected with different types of adenoviruses throughout our life, individuals might not actually respond to the vaccine virus well because it might be uh, neutralized by existing antibodies in the body. And the Moderna vaccine approach and the Pfizer vaccine approach is this mRNA vaccine. So this uh, mRNA is inside the lysosome, and when you inject it into the muscles, uh, it gets into the cells, uh, and this mRNA is released and translated by ribosome to make this viral protein, which is a protein, which is expressed on the cell surface. You get antibodies against it, and it, and it is processed within the cell and also presents to the T cells to get a robust T cell response. And, and the question, question we need, need to ask, to ask about COVID-19 vaccines, vaccines and everybody is interested in is, uh, is, is all, 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 all these vaccine trials are actually measuring the neutralizing antibody, uh, antibodies and whether and these associate with protection. protection. For most viruses, yes, yes. such as yes. Yes. mumps, measles and rubella. But for some, some viruses, viruses like dengue, the answer is no. no. Uh, so, so, so where SARS-CoV-2 falls, we, we don't know at this moment. How do these antibodies, how long do these antibodies last following vaccination? Big question. We know that uh, following natural infection, the antibodies win, especially in mild and asymptomatic individuals. And there are reports of reinfection. And how important is the cellular immune response to the vaccine? Does the vaccine prevent both mild and severe illness or only severe illness and single cell infected? Uh, and because of this varying immunity, do we need nearly two doses? In that, that case, who gets the vaccine? And, and of course, what are the possible side effects? Uh, now, now, UK approved the Pfizer vaccine, vaccine uh, and was uh, shown, shown to be 95% 95 effective in 28 days. days. So, uh, the study uh, evaluated 170 confirmed cases, of which 162 in the control group. Uh, uh, so, it, it, the data looks quite promising. There were 10 severe cases, of which 9 were in the vaccine group, 1 in the uh, Vaccine vaccine group. Group. But, but uh, no research has been uh, published in peer review journals. But I think after reviewing the data, existing data, the UK government thought uh, decided to go ahead. I, I believe many other countries are reviewing it. Then, but after the initial announcement on the 9th of November, 11th of November, Russia also came out and says that this vaccine is 90% uh, effective. Uh, and this was uh, the interim analysis of 20 cases, which is a quite a small sample number uh, and difficult to analyze. And they, anal they analyzed this data three weeks after receiving the vaccine. So, uh, so it's difficult to come to a conclusion, but again, uh, based, based on, on the very the limited analysis of 20 cases, cases. After, after a period of three weeks, weeks the, the, the data looks promising, but of course we need more data. data. Then, then uh, 16th of November, November for Goda represented this data, saying that it's 94% effective, but it didn't, it didn't give out any data as to who, how many cases did they analyze and, and on what basis are they actually saying that it's 94% effective. Uh, so we, we need to see the trial data for that. 
Oxford came, came out a uh, few days later, 23rd of November, saying that their vaccine, vaccine is actually, actually 70%, 70 effective, effective because the vaccine efficacy was different based on the different doses. So they had two dose regimes. One was a, a low dose followed by a high dose and the other was a high dose regime. And surprisingly, the low dose, dose followed by a high dose gave a 90% efficacy versus the uh, high dose regime. And uh, they, they had analyzed the cases in, in a... Uh, large number of individuals, but again, again these, these studies, studies are still ongoing, going and we uh, do not have the data to comment any further. And uh, so, and this and is the only vaccine, vaccine that they have uh, uh, analyzed, analyzed the data, data uh, the vaccine efficacy in individuals over 70 years, uh, uh, which is a 214 uh, population with both the high dose and low dose. So, all the individuals respond in the same way, the uh, same amount of antibodies as young individuals. And, and uh, one, uh, one important, important thing about the Oxford vaccine, vaccine they, they fortunately don't, don't make any uh, claims. They say that, I mean, it induces a good uh, high uh, amounts of neutralizing antibodies if the neutralizing antibodies correlate with protection. And basically, the, the simple the problem is we don't know if the presence of neutralizing antibodies is associated with protection, which is the important question. Now, this, this is one, one of the Chinese, Chinese vaccines, vaccines, which is the inactivated vaccine. vaccine. And, and uh, so, so this vaccine, uh, the manufacturers show that their uh, vaccine, vaccine induces a quick antibody response within 14 days. And based, based on the quick antibody response uh, that occurs in 14 days, uh, the, they have approved it for emergency use. And in China, about uh, 1 million or more individuals have already received the vaccine. And, and some, some have only developed mild disease according to the vaccine manufacturer. Again, the data is not available. However, the neutralizing antibody treaters induced by this inactivated vaccine was less than uh, seen in other vaccines. So this is just a comparison of the neutralizing antibody treaters. And uh, the treaters were uh, in one into uh, 300 at least uh, in that range for the other vaccines. But, but for the Sinovac, which is the inactivated vaccine, a Chinese vaccine, the neutralizing antibody treat as well less. Uh, we don't know whether that means it's, it's good or not, because we don't know whether neutralizing antibodies is correlated with protection in the first place. But anyway, uh, then coming to the questions, who gets the vaccine and when? We know that all the 7.6 billion population cannot get COVID vaccine. Uh, in, January, in January, or, or whenever, whenever the vaccines, vaccines are approved by the WHO. WHO. Uh, uh, so, so then, of course, it, 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 uh, the, who gets the vaccine, vaccine and, and when depends on, uh, of, of course, you have to be those, those who are most at risk and the vulnerable. Uh, uh, depends, of course, on the availability of the vaccine, availability of cold storage facilities, for instance, in countries like Sri Lanka. It is difficult to uh, uh, get down the modern or the Pfizer vaccine, which means minus 70 or minus 20 cold storage because it would be difficult to distribute them. And the funds, uh, how much funds are available to get these vaccines uh, down to Sri Lanka or in the country. In Sri Lanka, of course, we are getting 20% of the population, uh, vaccines enough for the 20% population through the COVAX program, which is very uh, promising. Then, uh, then, then other questions regarding who to vaccinate. vaccinate. Of course, these are uh, these questions we need to answer somehow or some, at some uh, day. Whether you should need to re-vaccinate re or, or, or vaccinate those, those who had already had COVID-19. Uh, uh, so if, if someone had already had COVID, uh, PCR positive, do you need to do should they be vaccinated? Should you need to check antibodies before the vaccination? Because a lot of people will get the asymptomatic infection. So is it cheaper to do antibody test and vaccinate? Uh, is the vaccine not effective if they have antibodies? Is it necessary to vaccinate if they have antibodies? Uh, questions. And uh, should children be vaccinated? Because none of the trials have included children less than 18 years. And of course, uh, children, uh, when you look at the data all around the world, most children have not had the infection, and the mortality rates are extremely low in children. So some of the questions. So just to summarize, there are many vaccines, 10 vaccines undergoing phase three clinical trials, the uh, entry analysis, which were uh, presented to uh, the scientific community through press releases, uh, looks promising. They have not been published in peer review journals, so it has solid communication. Everybody has it through uh, the press releases. And once they are, of course, published, everybody will be able to uh, uh, draw better conclusions. And 
given that, that this and this, this virus also goes into animals and, and infects animals, and given and that, that uh, the, the, the immunity, immunity might not be long lasting, uh, the, the question, question is, is do we go for herd immunity to stop transmission or do we vaccinate the vulnerable? And how this uh, COVID uh, vaccine will change? Will it be another two vaccine? Uh, those are questions that will unfold in the future. Uh, thank you. Everyone is talking about the vaccine. Now we'll be moving into the basic sciences, immunology, because it would be very important to understand the immunological basis uh, to understand about the vaccine and the therapeutics also. Uh, Professor Suranji Senaviratna, consultant of clinical immunology and allergy in the uh, UK. Suranjit, over to you. Uh, th thank you, Indika. Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you, Indika, and thank you for the invitation. What I'll do in this uh, in this uh, fifteen minutes is just go through a few aspects about the what is known about the immune aspects uh, or uh, related to COVID nineteen. I'll just talk about some immune changes, basic aspects, some changes, antibody, cellular responses, and then talk about some immune deficiency patients. Now, uh, all of us going back to the origin, all of us know that uh, there are different cells, there are B cells, T cells that are important with regards to immune responses. And in addition, there are different other cells like the neutrophil and the uh, in the immune landscape. So when it comes to T cells, there are different types of cells, Th1, Th2, T regulatory cells, Th17 cells, and these are different cells that produce different chemicals, called cytokines, which affect the immune response. And if you look at this uh, uh, figure, you have the uh, antigen presenting cell, which recognizes the organism or the sort of danger signal, and then it stimulates the production or, or integrates into a T cell and a B cell response. So you have the innate immune system, which then goes on to the adaptive immune system, and the T cell will produce cytokines, chemokines, etc. And the B cells with T cell help, and in most instances, would, would become plasma cells to produce immunoglobulin. So there are two pillars of the immune system, the immunoglobulin pathway with the B cells, and then you have the T cell uh, response with cytokines. When it comes to SARS-CoV-2, this figure has been known to many, many people, and everyone is quite aware of this. Uh, you have the spike protein, nucleocapsid protein, envelope membrane, etc. And you have to remember that the spike protein is only one of the structural proteins in SARS-CoV-2. And there are several other proteins that we have to take into account, especially when it comes to the immune response. And this is a sort of schematic comparing SARS-CoV-1, 2, and MERS. Uh, viruses, and you can see again here you have the spike protein, nucleocapsid protein, etc., which and the domain structure of the different uh, uh, genes and then producing the protein. So, this, this is the gene structure. Next, we come on to looking at the immune response in a patient who has SARS CoV 2. You have, I mean, well known. It has been well described that there is a lymphopenia and the most severe disease have a greater lymphopenia, T cell activation with different cytokines being produced that down here. You have T lymphocyte dysfunction, you have increased neutrophils, and there is effect on other cells of the immune system together with a big overdrive of cytokines. And these are the different cytokines that are given. Just note down IL-6, etc., IL-6 DNF alpha and then there are there is increased antibody production as a response to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now the important thing to remember is that in viral clearance you have one set of cytokines including the interferon uh, gamma pathway cytokines and in a dysregulated function hyperinflammation you get a whole range of other cytokines which can cause hyperinflammatory effects. And the question that came into this process was, can we try to neutralize the immune system, the immune response at this stage? Because are we, are we 
Uh, is there an increase in cytokine response, et cetera? And can we dampen down that response to prevent pathogenesis or pathology occurring? Now, very early in February, when it looked, so one of the important things to reduce the hyperinflammation is steroids. And very early, there was an article in the Lancet which showed, which suggested that steroids should not be used in this group of uh, patients because, they, as it was pointed out, that steroids uh, was were not effective or produced a uh, poor response in several other infections in the past when it comes to viral infection. However, data came out and uh, the recovery trial uh, found this, that when the, the administration of systemic steroids to reduce was beneficial compared with usual care of placebo in a group of patient to reduce 28 day mortality. And this is so far the only treatment that is coming in, coming to dampen our immune response because most other treatments have been not very effective. Next, we come on to uh, a drug I told you about IL-6. They tried tocilizumab, which is IL-6 inhibitor, and they found that it not to be effective in a double blind placebo control trial. However, there's another uh, trial that is ongoing, which is testing this, but the first trial uh, found that it was not beneficial. Next, it was can we give certain antibodies, certain neutralizing antibodies? If you can pick it up, what vaccinations, one method of producing antibodies could be get antibodies, specific antibodies, and give it to the people uh, to, who have COVID. And there are two uh, antibodies that are used at the moment the Lily antibody and another antibody. And this was the trial using the, the Lily antibody which again was found to be beneficial in mild to moderate uh, disease, but not in severe disease. So that's an important consideration to, to be made because the region run antibody 2 was stopped in severe COVID, but was it can be used in mild to moderate COVID. So again, this is in a selected group of patients looking to see with, whether we can affect the immune response that occurs in SARS-CoV-2. And finally, convalescent plasma has been used in many, many centers, but the first uh, important trial that came out was there was no significant difference in clinical stage to mortality in patients who received uh, coronavirus. Well. But again, there are several trials that are ongoing and more data will be coming in this pathway. So ultimately, when we look at this response, many of the drugs have not been very, very effective in COVID-19, uh, and that's where vaccination co comes into focus. Steroids are being used. And if we quickly look at the immune response that occurs. We have innate immune response, adaptive immune response, and then you have the memory T cell and the memory B cells together with the plasma cell producing antibodies. And these are the sort of schematics that are produced with regards to the, uh, to the immune responses present in SARS-CoV-2, following SARS-CoV-2. And then if you look at this, you have IgG and IgA, M, M and A response, and the IgG response a bit later. And some people, it just comes just before the IgM response. And then you have a CD4 and a CD8 response. And you want there to be memory. There has to be memory if you're trying to prevent and get to prevent a second infection. Or if you want to uh, uh, have good vaccine responses. And that is what has been assessed at the moment. Now, quite a lot of studies have been published on in this area in the last few months. There's one study published in Science where they've done deep, deep immune phenotype in our COVID. COVID-19 patients, they have been able to immunophenotype, categorize them into different categories, because based on the different categories, we will be able to intervene in a more specific way to be able to control the immune response and to harness the good parts of the immune response while knocking off the bad parts of the immune response. Next, I'll quickly go through certain antibody response, cellular response, which are which are targeted in the vaccine response, but this is through natural infection. What are the what is the pattern of the antibody and cellular responses? So, if you look at antibody responses, the early study showed that uh, there are uh, humoral immune responses to SARS-CoV-2. In this was a study in Iceland, and over four four months, the responses appear to persist without dropping off. However, another study was published in in uh, subsequently in nature medicine, which showed that the antibody responses followed the pathway as shown in the figure. And there appeared to be a slight waning of the, of the immune response as time went by. And this was followed by several studies after that, 
that showed a rapid delay in the anti SARS CoV 2 antibodies of people with mild COVID 19, together with uh, a large study from Imperial College showing the declining prevalence of SARS CoV 2 in a community study of a large number of patients that were that is in uh, to be published very soon. So the antibody response is present, but it appears to be uh, waning off that the antibody responses to children and adults are different. That, uh, and this is very important when it comes to the multi-system inflammatory disorder, because in children you have a dysregulated antibody response leading together with some cell response leading to, uh, to multi-system multi inflammation in a small subset of patients. And knowing this response is important because for treating those groups of patients in the correct way. Antibodies are social protection and reinfection. This is again a very recent study coming from Oxford, which appears to show that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is produced, but we know that a small group of patients can have uh, reinfection, but the vast majority appears to be protected, at least during the early stage. Next, we go on to cellular responses. We have gone through antibody responses, looking at the cellular responses very early on certain parts of the virus that stimulate cellular responses were identified by a group in San Diego. And these were initial studies very early, February, March time. And this was also extended further. And the responses appeared to be to a range of proteins in addition to the spike protein. And that is a very important thing to remember that it was not only spike protein that had the immune response following natural infection, but a number of other proteins in the virus. And uh, subsequently, two studies showed that the T cell response was not only present in patients who had COVID-19, but was also present in, in those in healthy control. So there was cross-reactivity with possibly other uh, uh, coronavirus infections that produce uh, common, common cold, et cetera. And these were two important studies which showed that even healthy donors, a certain percentage of healthy donors were find were having these antibodies that cross-reacted with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in addition, a paper found that people could have a T cell response without an antibody response or with the antibody response being very, very weak with that good T cell response, with a reasonable T cell response. And this is another important study saying that both T cell responses and antibody responses should be looked in when it comes to vaccination and natural immunity after an infection. So this has been taken and especially the San Diego group has done quite a lot of work in this area where they have found that patients with COVID-19 can have a T cell response and a, that's a CD4 and CD8 response. And this can be directed against different proteins, the spike protein, the membrane, the nucleocapsid protein, etc., and even a certain proportion of not unexposed patients can have this same response to a lower lower degree and to a broader uh, to a narrower range of the proteins as opposed to SARS-CoV-2. As you go older, they have found that the responses seem to be more dysregulated, uh, at least in the natural immune uh, pathway, and that is something to be studied, especially with the vaccines. And uh, uh, this was a sort of schematic show the difference in the responses in mild and uh, acute, uh, severe COVID. Was, uh, the study was done by the Oxford group. A whole range of different proteins were targeted in the different uh, categories of patients. And this was the time period over which these different responses evolved. And this was again a schematic that is that has been followed at the moment with regards to the Cellular, some of the cellular responses post COVID. Now, the important thing is antibody responses seem to wane in off. What about the T cell response? There's again a recent study from the UK showed that the data reaction that function T responses seems at least at six months was present and appeared to be functional in that period. And that, so, that is some good uh, news that the antibody response, the T cell response may be persisting for longer than the antibody response, but further studies will have to come. Other cells are important in addition to T cell, B cell, these other different cell mate cells, etc. This was schematic showing that both uh, the classical pathway and the atypical 
T cell responses would come into uh, 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 postulated to come into play with regards to SARS CoV 2. So, basically, what I've done so far is spoken to you about the basic aspect, the immune changes, and that steroids appears to be the only drug that is uh, having some clinical role, while the others are only in selected groups of patients. Antibody responses about the waning pathway, the cellular responses to a range of different protein. And finally, just two slides to talk about immune deficiency because that is a group of patients that we deal with, especially primary immune deficiency and secondary immune deficiency. What is that? What about those patients? Should they be? What is the level of uh, sort of isolation that they should be uh, going into, etc.? And we have a whole range of immune deficiency condition, especially. Uh, this was a study done in the UK, which showed that both primary and secondary antibody deficiency patients could display greater morbidity and mortality. Uh, this was a small study, but uh, is in progress at the moment. And uh, the important thing is that the secondary antibody deficiency patients were the ones that appeared to be showing a greater risk, a greater propensity to issues like uh, more severe mor morbidity and mortality. There was another different study that was published recently, which uh, again showed that uh, patients can, quite a few patients develop mild disease, but there are some others who develop more severe disease, and further studies are in, in progress. So this is a quick run through uh, of uh, telling you about uh, basic responses that we would see following an infection, a viral infection, which has taken over the sort of world and Chain things quite a lot over the period of time. The immune changes, I touched on the immune changes that occur together with the clinical implications with regards to steroids and, uh, the, the, and the cytokine inhibitors, uh, the different monoclonal antibodies and uh, uh, convalescent plasma. I told you about the antibody responses and the sort of the studies that have shown the antibody responses and the appearance of slight waning or slight waning of the different uh, responses as time goes by and that has important aspects with regards to vaccination would we have to vaccinate the person if we get antibody response predominant antibody every year except and those, those studies will come on the cellular responses with regards to t cells cd4 cells cd8 cells and the important uh, parts of the virus that are targeted by these cells and how it lasts and then I touched about immune deficiency and the importance of targeting both the primary, uh, primary immune deficiency patients and secondary immune deficiency patients. So ultimately, it comes into quite a lot of drugs have been uh, sort of targeted in this condition. There has been repurposing of certain drugs, etc. However, ultimately, it appears that quite a few drugs are not having much benefit. And we would be going to, Nidika touched on this, the vaccine. Uh, I think uh, that's the important with regards to global vaccine landscape number of agents and uh, everyone is uh, holding their breath with regards to the vaccine, being able to bring this uh, uh, pandemic under control together with the other responses such as adequate social distancing, masks, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Senaviratne, for a very enlightening <clears throat> uh, talk covering the whole gamut of the neurological responses and how they have been used for the therapeutic research until now uh, and uh, what the implications are moving forward. For the last uh, presentation of the session today, uh, it's my pleasure to invite Professor Nadraja Sriharan, who currently uh, holds visiting professorships of, at King's College London and at the University of Jaffna. Uh, he's also a consultant to the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries. Uh, a graduate from University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, he did his post-graduation clinical training in internal medicine and PhD in cardiovascular studies. Um, and uh, he assumed the role of a foundation chair in medicine at the University of Jaffna. Professor Sriharan will be speaking to us on new paradigms in the development of therapeutics for COVID-19. Over to you, Professor Sriharan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Uh, 
Um, I want to thank the organizers for granting me this privilege to share my thoughts with you on the paradigm shifts and some of the challenges facing the development of therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19. We live in extraordinary times and the response of the scientific community, the global community has also been unprecedented. Here we are just one year into the introduction of a new virus and a new disease. And we have several therapeutic options and vaccine leads that are about to be deployed. I will just take you through a very quick bird's eye view of some of these paradigm shifts and some of the challenges that still exist. Uh, first of all, the deployment of accelerated development and regulatory pathway. We heard about that from Professor Nelika as well, uh, where the drug development process, which is traditionally sequential in nature, has been transformed into parallel and overlapping processes. And that has been made possible by, I would say, an unprecedented collaboration across all the stakeholders involved in the development process, uh, public sector, private sector, academia, governments, NGOs, and regulators. And I think what this has done, it has removed some of the, what I would call bureaucratic, unproductive interfaces that always existed in the development pathway, and that has enhanced productivity and shortened development time. The deployment of novel study designs, particularly the adaptive study designs. These are designs that are traditionally used in small scale clinical pharmacology studies, were incorporated into the large scale phase three programs, whereby multiple interventions could be tested in a single protocol. Recovery trial and the solidarity trials are very good examples of that. So quick decisions can be made about the utility or otherwise of those interventions. The standardization of protocols and endpoints, particularly in vaccine development, so that we now have multiple vaccine candidates from different platform technologies, we are able to compare uh, the benefit to risk profiles of those vaccines to make decisions. And also the regulatory agencies have stepped up with real time rolling review of the regulatory data uh, using artificial intelligence techniques as well so that quick decisions can be made and as has been made with the MHRA, for example, recently. However, it is important to realize even in a pandemic, even in a pandemic, scientific principles cannot be compromised. And by and large, we have maintained the scientific rigor so far in this process. And also it's important to make sure we don't lose the basics of the benefit to risk of medicines that they're assessed carefully, they're articulated carefully and conveyed transparently to the scientific community and the public at large. Sometimes it is worrying to see benefit and safety being described as binary parameters. You know, you hear statements perhaps from politicians, even in some of the scientific communications, uh, we will deliver a safe and effective vaccines as if they were binary parameters. They are not. They are continuous variables along this benefit to risk paradigm. And therefore it's very important to quantify benefit and quantify the risk and articulate that very carefully. So if you look at the vaccine development program, it follows this benefit to risk pathway. We start with a number of lead vaccines, so over 200 in number with the COVID-19. And at the beginning, because there is very little data, uh, they have to be assumed to have 100% risk and zero benefit. And through targeted development programs, as has happened over the year, the objective is to end up with a completed vaccine. And we are still not there. What we have is some excellent developmental vaccines which are being released because it's a pandemic through limited usage or emergency usage. Uh, it happened with the Chinese and the Russian vaccines fairly early on in the development process. We are getting, the good news is we are getting very close to the completed vaccine stage, but still I want to emphasize there are developmental vaccines being released under emergency use in a pandemic. So it's very important that we all continue to collect the data long-term safety, long-term efficacy, even when the vaccines are deployed into the public at large. 
As far as the therapeutics are concerned, great scientific advances in terms of, as uh, Suranjit articulated, in terms of uh, delineating the molecular and the cellular mechanisms involved in COVID-19 disease, the entry of the virus, the replication of the virus, understanding the inflammatory cytokine cascade, which causes severe disease, and to recognize the coagulation, coagulopathy element of this, which has allowed, understanding these molecular targets have allowed the development of molecules, both repositioning of existing molecules and innovating new chemical entities to modulate these targets. So this has, what has happened over the last year, a, a two-pronged strategy. Because it is a pandemic, the immediate response was to reposition existing medicines. Uh, but it's important to realize that just because a medicine has a good optimal benefit to risk profile in one disease, for example, chloroquine resistant malaria, it doesn't automatically translate into a good benefit to risk profile to another disease. But significant process, progress has been made. I'm not going to go through them in details. I've just listed some of the reposition medicine. Of course, the real success story is dexamethasone, a simple and safe, widely available medicine in the recovery trial was shown to save lives in oxygen dependent patients in the late stage disease. What it has shown is proof of concept. It has shown that not only is there an inflammatory cascade in the late stage disease, but suppressing that inflammation can save life. So it augurs well, we have to wait and see, augurs well for the number of other anti-inflammatory drugs, more targeted drugs that are currently in clinical trials. The jury is still out there, we have to wait and see for the data. Remdesivir is good, not as effective as dexamethasone, no, no mortality benefit, but does shorten duration of symptoms and, and duration of stay in hospital. And then of course the use, the judicious use of antithrombotics, recognizing the coagulopathy, the judicious use of, use of antithrombotics uh, in managing the uh, coagulopathy that exists. And as I said, some disappointing news with drugs which showed potential, the anti-HIV drugs and hydroxychloroquine, the data is still not there to demonstrate its benefit in the tested patients. The door is still open. It is possible some of these drugs, including hydroxychloroquine, may work very early on in pre-exposure pro prophylaxis, but we don't have that data. And because we do not know the longevity of this virus, whether it'll last for a year, two years, three years, it's very important to continue to search for new molecules. And that program is ongoing. There are a number of discovery and development programs looking at new chemical entities against the various targets. For example, a lot of work going on modulating the ACE2 receptor. But these are new molecules and the data will take time for it to be delivered. But as Suranjit said, good news on the recombinant antibodies from both Regeneron and Eli Lilly, a cocktail of these antibodies regenerated do well in early disease. That comes to the next point I want to make, and that is to target the right drug for the right population of patients. It's not a new paradigm, it's reinforcing an existing paradigm. And it's very important to understand the clinical course of COVID-19. It's very clearly delineated now into an early stage disease, mid stage disease, and the late stage cytokine uh, uh, cascade. And therefore, I call it the Goldilocks syndrome. Like in the story of Goldilocks and the porridge, not too hot, not too cold. Here it's a question of not too early, not too late. Very important to target these drugs, both in clinical trials and in clinical usage to the right population of patients. So antiviral drugs like remdesivir and the monoclonals early on in the disease, because there's no benefit if you give it too late. And the anti-inflammatory drugs like dexamethasone late in the phase, because if you give it early, the recovery trial showed that there was trend towards increased mortality. You don't want to suppress the inflammation and immune response early on. Similarly, antithrombotics to be used very carefully in patients who are at risk and who demonstrate the coagulopathy. But it is very clear that no single drug will is going to be a game changer. You know, it's almost like the HIV paradigm. 
We already know that it's very likely we will need a cocktail of drugs bespoke, bespoke to each patient based on their clinical uh, spectrum or clinical symptoms uh, will be the way to manage these, uh, uh, these patients. I just want to say a few words before I finish. Uh, Nilika has given a comprehensive review of the vaccines. I want to reinforce certain messages and some of the challenges. One of the reasons we have had a vaccine nearly developed in one year's time, before that the fastest development of a vaccine was the mumps vaccines, took four years. In addition to the accelerated development pathways, the investment that has gone on into novel platform technologies over the last four or five years uh, in developing vaccines for the SARS, the MERS, and the Ebola virus. So we had a cassette record. I call it a cassette record. It was ready. And it's a question of slipping the cassettes in. And that's one of the main reasons why we have so many new technologies delivering vaccine candidates quickly. However, global pandemics need global solutions. You all know this as public health professionals, and we need a number of vaccines to vaccinate the world. Again, therefore, good news, there are several candidates in the portfolio. And also we need vaccine candidates from different technologies, not only to mitigate the risk of failure, because some of these technologies may fail. So far, I must say the news is great because people never expected 95% efficacy in some of these vaccines, new, new platform technology vaccines, so that's good news. But we also need vaccines from different technologies to use in different locations, different environments, in different subgroups. The data will emerge so that certain vaccines and certain technologies can be targeted, bespoke to certain population of patients. Nilika has already shown this slide. I'm not going to go through it, but a key message here is that these vaccines will have different properties and different advantages and disadvantages in terms of cost, in terms of storage. And so far, all the vaccines are two dose regimes, which is problematic in vaccinating the world. But one of the other messages is, and we already know that, the first drug or the first vaccine may not be the best. There will be further developments that will take place. And we already know from the CEO of BioNTech that the second generation of RNA vaccines are being developed. And I hope that with time, the cost will come down, the stability will increase, and you could have RNA vaccines, which may be single dose vaccines, and which can be used in the uh, conditions where uh, storage facilities may not be available. So we have to wait and see, and the program has started I am very optimistic that further development will continue to try and enhance the quality of these vaccines. There are some challenges that exist and uh, already articulated few of these. One of the ones is will the virus mutate? It is an RNA virus. It has mutated several hundred times, but fortunately not significant enough to have an implication for the existing vaccine program but again, the good news is the analogy of the cassette recorder. Once you have the platform technology in place, it's very easy or much easier to switch to the next vaccine candidate. So even if it does mutate, we don't need to do the full scale phase four, phase three programs that are needed. We all need to have more data on the duration of productivity. These are all trials with three month data, as you heard heard before, we need to understand how long the protectivity will last and also against what. At the moment, we have good evidence that the, the vaccines that I've reported are effective against clinical disease and also appears to be uh, effective against serious disease. Small numbers of patients, but we need to await the data whether they protect against transmission. And that will determine the overall vaccination strategy, whether you're going to just give it to the high risk groups to protect them from severe disease, or it's, is it going to be a public health measure? I like to think it's the latter as well, where you populate the world to create a population immunity. And for that, we need to have more data in terms of the effectiveness of these vaccines in transmitting disease. And I personally feel that will come. It's, it's very likely they'll be effective. I don't know how effective, but they will be effective against transmission. 
fingers crossed. And of course, the other question of long-term safety. We have three months safety now. The good news is if you look at all the vaccines that have been developed over the last four decades, 95% of the adverse effects occur in the first 40 days after dosing. Therefore, the fact that the vaccines are safe, no major side effects at three months, augurs well that they are as effective, probably as effective as the vaccines we have, but that's not good enough. We need to continue to collect more safety data, long-term safety, so that the rare, very rare, however dangerous side effects are monitored and picked up. So one needs, and I think in many of the countries that's happening, very good effective pharmacovigilance systems to try and monitor for safety. And one final point, we need to continue the clinical assessment of these vaccines. The current vaccines, new vaccines, and there are a number of issues that we need to consider. I, don't, I won't go into the detail. The ethics of continuing and scheduling control studies. What will be the control arm? Once you have a vaccine available, it may become unethical to do placebo control studies. You might have to do the studies against the gold standard. We are not there as yet. And my final slide is what next? What do we do? Having a vaccine is not the final solution. We, we are in a marathon, not a sprint. And all of you as public health professionals know that. I won't go into the detail. We have to vaccinate the world and make sure we have affordable vaccines and vaccines are made accessible to the world. And a lot of work needs to go in to overcome unfortunate vaccine hesitancy that still exists. So as medical professionals and public health professionals, it's our duty to be transparent and educate and communicate to the world the role of the vaccines, how they can bring this pandemic to a close. Vaccines and therapies are not silver bullets. You see, they are very important tools in the toolbox, but we have to continue with the fundamental public health measures that all of you as public health professionals all over the world and the Western countries need to learn a lot from the Asian countries of what fantastic work that has gone on in terms of public health measures that has contained the virus. They need to continue and that's not a bad thing because if we learn good, good habits, they will help in controlling other infections, respiratory infections, flus and so on. And my final point is that we all need to learn the lessons from this epidemic so that we carry the lessons on to the new normal, to the new post-COVID world, so that we are better prepared for the next pandemic, which will surely come. Uh, we will learn from some of the ways that we have developed drugs and vaccines quickly and continue some of the processes and learnings into the new world so that high quality drugs and vaccines are developed, not just for the Western countries, but for the whole world. And at a personal level, I hope we will all become better people and make the world a better place. I think the virus has shone, <laughs> shone a mirror onto the world societies. We cannot have a world that is divided with haves and have nots and that we will move forward into a better world as a result of this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sriharan, for this very um very lucid and um, fascinating talk, looking at the paradigm shifts that has happened during the pandemic. And um, unfortunately, we may not have time for taking questions, but as Professor Karunathilaki said, please put in your questions in the Zoom chat, and hopefully in the proceedings of the conference, some of those questions would be answered. Um, so in summary, what some a few take home messages and i would start with the last speaker some of the things what he said was that a there is no one magic silver bullet we will have to look at a comprehensive set of interventions vaccine just adds on to the to our public health and social measures so while we are excited about the news of the vaccine and uh, as the presenters have said there are still many questions that need to be answered. We need to continue to look for more data, more analysis on the safety, efficacy, and what is it that the vaccine can do and what it cannot. 
at the same time continue to focus on the public health measures that have proven to be, uh, they have proven and have stood the test of time in the pandemic response as seen by many Southeast Asian countries. And um, as we move forward, while we'll continue to collaborate and collaboration and solidarity has been two very strong foundations of the pandemic response. Without that, we would not have reached where we are one year into the pandemic. And we have seen so many scientific discoveries and novel technologies that have been harnessed to, pre to preserve lives and also uh, livelihoods. Uh, in closing, I would just like to say that as we face this pandemic and move towards recovery, hopefully, we need to continue to invest in our public health systems, as was, um, as was highlighted earlier in the day, that the economic health is closely interlinked with the public health. So we need to continue to invest in robust public health systems, focus on the preparedness and resilience of our health systems, to have not only better response, but perhaps pandemic proof. The pandemic has, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has revealed how unprepared the world was. And the next pandemic is not a question of if, it's a matter of when. And when it happens, we should not be in the same situation as we were with the COVID-19. As we recover, let's recover better and for the better recovery, not just for the people, but also for the planet, because it's closely interlinked. And if we do not take care of our planetary health, it would be very difficult to continue to have good population health. Uh, with that, I would like to hand over to Professor Karna Tilake for final words and some housekeeping. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asya Pense. Uh, before we move into the uh, the proceedings and there may be some housekeeping announcement. I would like to hand over a token of appreciation for my coach and WHO country representative of Sri Lanka, Dr. Asya Pense. It's a symbolic token of appreciation of all the resource persons.